Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from John Russell, Alice Bryant, and Brian Lynn. Later, we will present the next part in our series on America's national parks. But first, here is John Russell. The coronavirus crisis is changing the world of autonomous or self-driving cars. More companies are now thinking about using the vehicles to deliver goods instead of people. John Krafchick is the head of Waymo, a self-driving technology company owned by Google's parent, Alphabet. Earlier this month, Krafchick told the Reuters news agency, The reality right now is that goods delivery is a bigger market than moving people. Waymo started out working on autonomous taxis, but has also been developing self-driving trucks and delivery vehicles. The company recently raised $750 million from investors. It has signed deals with shipping company UPS and major retailer Walmart to test the delivery of goods. But Waymo is not the only company raising new financing. Over the past seven months, investors have put at least $6 billion into more than 20 companies working on autonomous delivery of goods and food. These include autonomous flying vehicles and heavy trucks, a recent Reuters study found. Most of that investment, at least $4 billion since January, went to big companies like Waymo and Didi Chuxing, China's biggest ride-sharing company. Both companies are attempting to create separate autonomous vehicle services to carry goods and people. While delivery robots built to operate on sidewalks have received much media attention, they have drawn little recent investment. Still, an increasing number of cities and companies are trying them out. Christopher Bruno is head of the Fairfax, Virginia Economic Development Office. He worked to get Starship sidewalk robots on the streets as soon as the coronavirus crisis shut down the area. I think without a crisis, there would have been some skepticism as to whether this would have been used or not, Bruno said. Skepticism refers to a kind of doubt. Bruno said even though the approval process for new businesses usually takes six to ten months, we did it in a week and a half. Currently, twenty robots are delivering food and other products in Fairfax. Some investors warn that recent media coverage has increased hopes too much about autonomous delivery services which still face technical and legal difficulties. Quinn Garcia is the managing director of Autotech Ventures. He noted there is a certain amount of hype, talk that makes people excited, around autonomous delivery. While there's increased hype around automated delivery right now due to coronavirus, he said, this health crisis will be mostly resolved in a few years from now before automated on-road delivery is ready for mass adoption. Still, 
autonomous startups are seeking to take advantage of virus-driven publicity for human-free delivery services. These include Michigan-based autonomous delivery startup Refraction AI, sidewalk robot maker KiwiBot in California, and self-driving technology company Optimus Ride in Boston. Ireland-based Mana Drone is also seeking to enter the market. All the companies are involved in money raising as demand for their delivery services has increased. Phantom Auto, which makes software to control delivery robots, has also seen rising demand and expects to raise more money this year. James Peng is the founder and CEO of Pony.ai. The company recently carried out tests of its vehicles for food deliveries in California during the pandemic. Peng noted that the virus crisis has created a need to provide some much-needed food and package delivery services. The coronavirus is killing thousands and commanding government attention across Latin America. But another deadly viral infection remains a problem for the region, dengue. Dengue, which is spread by mosquitoes, has been called breakbone fever for the severe physical pain it causes. Doctors and health officials are concerned about the effect of COVID-19, the breathing disorder caused by the virus, on Latin American countries. They say COVID-19's arrival has pulled attention and resources away from the fight against dengue. The Pan American Health Organization, PAHO, expects 2020 to be marked by high rates of dengue across the region. Around the world, COVID-19 has affected other diseases in different ways. In Europe, measures to stop the coronavirus have banished seasonal influenza. But in Africa, border closures have stopped transportation of measles vaccines and other supplies. In Latin America, a dengue epidemic that started in late 2018 is still present. Dengue infections in the region rose sharply to an all-time high of 3.1 million in 2019, with over 1,500 deaths in Latin America and the Caribbean. That information comes from PAHO. Cases of the disease should begin to decrease in the second half of 2020, the organization said. Dengue epidemics usually happen every three to five years, and with four strains of dengue in existence, people may catch it more than once. Second cases are more likely to be severe. COVID is the star right now so all of the attention is being put on COVID, said Jaime Gomez. But there are still problems with dengue. He is a doctor and works at a hospital in Florida Blanca in Colombia's Santander province. Dengue is not usually deadly and can be treated with painkillers, but some sufferers deal with long-term problems like tiredness, weight loss, and depression. And these things affect their ability to work. Severe dengue is treated with intravenous fluids, and those who do not get tested are at risk of dangerous health problems. Such treatments cannot be given if patients stay home, worried about getting the coronavirus or if crowded hospitals cannot take dengue patients. There are not many cases of COVID-19 in the part of Colombia 
where Gomez works. He told Reuters news agency he had seen hospitalizations decrease by half as people were fearful of going outdoors. Sonia Fernandez is a lawyer from Paraguay. She avoided seeking medical care when she and her two daughters, ages 11 and 8, got sick with dengue at the beginning of April. Fernandez wanted to avoid individuals with COVID-19, she said. All three have since recovered. Dengue cases in Paraguay have sharply risen this year. In the first 18 weeks of 2020, the country reported more than 40,000 confirmed cases and more than 60 deaths. That is, compared to under 400 confirmed cases and six deaths during the same period in 2019. In Ecuador, the coronavirus outbreak has hit hard. Hospitals in Guayaquil, the largest city, are full. The number of dengue cases has dropped nationwide, but this could cover up other issues. Ecuador's health ministry notes that dengue cases were highest at close to 900 in the week ending March 14th. That is two weeks after the country confirmed its first case of COVID-19. For the week of April 4th, they fell to around 250. Esteban Ortiz is an international health researcher at the University of the Americas in Quito. He says dengue cases are being underreported. Cases haven't decreased. The diagnosis of cases has decreased, which confirms the system has totally collapsed, he said. Ecuador's health ministry said that the country was no more exposed to the double effects of COVID-19 and dengue than any other Latin American country. It added it has the supplies it needs to treat cases of dengue. Dengue has also increased sharply in Central America. In Costa Rica, cases have risen nearly 200% through May 1st, compared with a year ago to over 2,000. Rodrigo Marin is director of Costa Rica's Health Surveillance Agency. He told Reuters, that while his country is having a difficult time dealing with COVID-19, other diseases continue to spread. In Panama, dengue has caused at least two deaths this year. Speaking with Reuters, Panama City health official Yamileth Lopez said that dengue kills two. Many internet tools seek to identify what disease a person has based on symptoms described by the user. A new study finds these online symptom checkers are rarely correct and could be harmful. Australian researchers at Edith Cohen University in Perth, Australia, did the study. Their results were published in the Medical Journal of Australia. Online symptom checkers are commonly found through major search engines. Google, for example, gets an estimated 70,000 health-related searches every minute. The study examined 36 international internet-based symptom checkers. The tools ask a series of questions about the symptoms users are experiencing and then use that information to identify conditions the users might suffer from. 
Some tools also advise users on whether to seek medical attention. The study found that overall, symptom checkers produced the correct diagnosis as the first result 36% of the time. The tools predicted the right diagnosis within the top three results 52% of the time. Michelle Hill is a student at Edith Cohen and a leader of the research. She says the findings demonstrate why users should be very careful about using the systems for diagnostic purposes. While it may be tempting to use these tools to find out what may be causing your symptoms, most of the time they are unreliable at best and can be dangerous at worst, Hill said. She said one of the main problems with online symptom checkers is that they depend on too little information. They do not look at the whole picture. They don't know your medical history or other symptoms. Hill added, for people who lack health knowledge, they may think the advice they're given is accurate or that their condition is not serious, when it may be. The Australian study did find the symptom checkers produced more accurate results for advice on when and where users should seek medical attention. The advice for emergency and serious medical cases was correct about 60% of the time. That number dropped to 30 to 40% accuracy for non-emergencies. Hill said she does think online symptom tools can effectively fill a need in the modern health system. These sites are not a replacement for going to the doctor, but they can be useful in providing more information once you do have an official diagnosis, she said. Internet searches related to information about the new coronavirus topped all others in recent months on Google, the Google Trends website reports. Many users have also turned to Google for information on virus symptoms. The top searched coronavirus symptom by far over the past four months was fever, Google Trends shows. This was followed by sore throat, shortness of breath, loss of taste, and loss of smell. Google also provides a tool for users to check their symptoms related to COVID-19, the disease caused by the coronavirus. The company says the tool is designed for informational purposes only and not meant to provide a medical diagnosis. The World Health Organization, WHO, said earlier this month it is planning to launch its own symptom checking tool. A WHO official told the Reuters news agency the wireless device tool is expected to be popular in countries lacking their own development resources. Engineers and designers, including former Google and Microsoft employees, have been volunteering their time to develop the WHO app, Reuters reported. I'm Brian Lynn. To help protect yourself against the new coronavirus, wash your hands for 20 seconds with soap and water before you eat, after using the toilet, and after touching anything many other people touch, like a seat on a public bus. If you cannot wash your hands with soap and water, use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer that contains at least 60% alcohol. 
Taking these steps can help prevent not only the new coronavirus disease, but also colds, flu, and other viruses. For more information, visit the following websites. The World Health Organization at www.who.int or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at www.cdc.gov. On our National Parks journey, we explore a remote island near Michigan's border with Canada. It sits within a huge freshwater lake. It is one of the least visited national parks in America. Welcome to Isle Royale National Park. Isle Royale is surrounded by the deep blue waters of Lake Superior, the largest freshwater lake on Earth by area. The park's quiet forests and rocky shores offer a kind of solitude and peace not found in some of the more popular national parks. No cars or other wheeled vehicles are permitted on Isle Royale. There are no real roads on the island. The only way to get to the park is by boat or seaplane. The National Park Service operates shuttle boats that take visitors to Isle Royale. The boats leave from two Michigan ports. The journey to Isle Royale takes three to five hours. Waters are often extremely rough. Isle Royale is the largest of the islands within the National Park. It is 72 kilometers long. The entire National Park protects a total area of 230,000 hectares, including some 450 islands that surround Isle Royale. 52,000 hectares is land. The rest is water. Isle Royale became a national park in 1940. In 1980, Officials named it an International Biosphere Reserve because of its unique ecosystem. Its remote location is part of what makes it among the least visited national parks. But once they arrive, most visitors stay a while. The average stay for visitors to Isle Royale National Park is 3.5 days. The average stay for visitors to most other national parks is just 4 hours. Isle Royale offers hiking, camping, boating, and even scuba diving. The extremely cold waters of Lake Superior help keep shipwrecks in excellent condition. The National Park Service protects 11 sunken boats for divers to explore. They are reminders of Lake Superior's commercial shipping history. The sunken wooden ship called the America is one of the most popular dive sites. The America carried passengers, mail, and supplies to many towns along the shores of Lake Superior. It first launched in 1898 and was used until 1928 when it was damaged. It sank to the bottom of the lake soon after. Today, divers can swim through the ship's ballroom, bedrooms, and engine room. Painted on the ship's engine is an American flag. 
Many divers take pictures of this site. The Rock Harbor Lighthouse is another reminder of the area's commercial history. Workers built the lighthouse in the 1850s to help guide ships safely to the island's copper mines. The mining industry was short-lived, however. The lighthouse itself lit the way for ships for just 24 years. But it still stands today. Inside, exhibits and information help visitors understand Isle Royal's maritime history. A short hiking trail leads visitors to the lighthouse. Visitors to Isle Royal share the trails with a well-studied population of moose and wolves. Both species migrated to the island sometime in the early to mid-1900s. Scientists believe that moose swam to the island. They think wolves walked there during a freeze of the lake sometime in the 1940s. Scientists have closely studied the relationship between Isle Royal's wolves and moose since the late 1950s. It is one of the best studied predatory prey relationships in the world. Researchers closely record their population numbers. Much of the research takes place during the winter when the trees are bare. The researchers fly over the island to observe the animals from above. Animal research is the only winter activity going on at Isle Royal. The National Park is closed each year beginning in late October because of the harsh weather conditions. It reopens in springtime the next year. But for the other months of the year, Isle Royal offers refreshing lake breezes, green forests, and clear blue waters. Its stunning scenery and unusual solitude keep visitors returning year after year. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. <laughs>